Science communication is changing rapidly and has it began to change around about 50 years ago. So I'm just completing a book, editing a book, which looks at how science communication has developed and what's been tried uh, in 39 different countries around the world, including Portugal, including Brazil, but another 37 countries. And it's explored the changes that have taken place in that time. So have new science centres, new interactive science centres been developed? Have university courses been started in that time? What about science festivals and science fairs? Uh, what about the media? How has that changed? And in all those areas, there have been some significant changes in countries around the world. Well, we all have to get used to modern ways of living, and I think the change in press has, has upset some people, but it's inevitable. It has opportunities as well as threats, and it means that many more voices are being heard, and there are no longer a single few voices of authority which have been in the past. On the neg negative side of this, it means that uh, many of the critics of science, many of the peoples who are sceptical about science, also have a voice and they can present what appears to be a credible voice using the new forms of media. And because of that, the, the authoritative voice of science, which used to be respected and considered and felt in all policy fields, is now, it's been softened, it's been weakened in that way. And some people and some leading politicians around the world are denying the science and instead following myth and superstition and wild found theory that has no bearing in fact. I think scientists are angry and they're sad and they're disappointed at the way that the voice that they presented, the voice of reason and the voice of authority has been eroded and they see it being replaced by something which is much less worthy. And they're not sure how to counter this. They're not sure what they should be doing by way of science communication, and they're not sure how they should be going about it. But communication for scientists has always been slightly problematic. Some scientists are wonderful at doing science communication, and we've seen people on television who can explain complicated ideas very simply and very colourfully. We've seen, though, many scientists who are reluctant to come out into the public arena now because they know that any response they make might meet with uh, scepticism or derision or an angry response uh, uh, or hates on Facebook. And I think that the other component to be taken into consideration here is that scientists have a very demanding job as it is. They have a full-time job and then they're expected to communicate on top of it. And so they don't get rewarded for their communication efforts. They don't get promotions, they don't get appointments, generally speaking. And although institutions expect them to communicate, and to some extent want them to communicate about their work, they don't recognise these efforts. And you can see this in the, in the partial failure of the third mission activities across Europe. Uh, the book is called Science Communication, A Global Perspective. Now, it's going to be published by the press at Australian National University in Australia. And the reason we went down this track is because it's going to be available free online. So people can download it by a chapter or the whole book, whatever they like. They will see 39 stories. And so 39 different countries are telling the story for how science communication has developed in their country. So they will talk about the historical background. So in the, case of, in the case of Brazil, they'll talk about the colonial period. They'll talk about the period when the, when the Portuguese court arrived in Brazil uh, in the early 19th century. They'll talk about the creation of the botanical gardens and the first museums. They will talk about uh, the tumult, tumult of the 1920s when the radio stations were formed and the Brazilian Academy of Science was found. They'll talk about the debates after the war, after World War II, over nuclear issues and so on. And then they'll go on to what we call the modern era 
and the modern era, uh, the development of um, hands-on science museums, the, the beginning of, of university courses to train science communicators, uh, the start of radio and television programs which were devoted to science. Uh, and so it's, it's a complete history of science communication which really focuses on the events of about the last 30 or 40 years. Some issues are shared across countries across the world. One of the, one of the best things about the book, I think, is that there's a huge diversity in the countries that are involved. So if you look at it in terms of the gross domestic product of the countries, the poorest country is Uganda, which has a gross domestic product of about 650 US per year. At the other end of the spectrum, you have Norway, which has a gross domestic product of 81,000 US per year. And that's a factor of 127. So the issues that affect countries like Uganda will be different to the issues which confront countries like Norway. Uganda is more going to be more concerned with providing basic agriculture and health services and trying to lift the economy of the country. Norway is going to be con more concerned about ethical issues and issues of democracy to allow the people to have a full say in what sort of research is carried out and what the implications of this research are. But some questions are almost universal and the Brazilian chapter identified three of those. And the first challenge in the Brazilian chapter is one of inequality and the fact that much of science communication activity is only available to people living in the cities and the large regional centres. Museums, films, exhibitions, talks, uh, universities and so on. Once you go outside the city into the rural areas, it's difficult to access these. There's also a, a wealth issue. It's much easier for the middle class, richer people to access these issues than poorer people. So that was the first challenge, one of inequality, and that is felt across the world. The second question was one of the fact that, that science is a marginal issue in terms of determining elections. You find it very rare for any election to be fought on a scientific issue. It will be fought on jobs, or it will be fought on health, or transport, or schools, or issues like that. So science, although governments say they like science and they want science, it's easy for it to fall off the funding, the back of the funding truck. And so the issue that the Brazilian chapter identified was we need robust policies about science and about science communication. You can't just turn the tap on and then turn the tap off for science. It has to be a continuous thread because projects take years, decades to come to fulfilment. And so if you have a change of government and the next government is not interested in science, suddenly funding stops and science communication stops. You can't just turn it on again three years later when you have another election. So robustness. Uh, the third issue was about quality, improving the quality of training, the quality of experience students get when they're at university, the quality of the technology that appears in the interactive science centres, the museums around the place. So they were the three challenges that Brazil identified, and I think they are universal. The same, the same issues would apply in Portugal, but Portugal is an interesting case because it appears to an outside observer to have significantly lifted its game in science communication over the past five or eight years. They have a, an association for science communicators. Five years ago, there wasn't one. They have a, a conference, an annual conference for science communication, and you go back the last decade, there wasn't one. So I think... Uh, uh, there is research is being carried out in Portugal and some Portuguese researchers are leading projects with, across Europe and also stretching into Latin America. So Portugal, for some reason, and I don't know what, what the reason is, has lifted its game uh, uh, in the last decade. Se você gostou desse vídeo, dê um like, compartilhe. 
Aproveite para assinar o canal e ative as notificações.